So I would like to welcome Matthias Vermeulen, uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly, who will be moderating the panel. Uh, Matthias is the Public Policy Director at AWO, WO, a data rights agency with brush, uh, branches in London, Paris and Brussels, who has been working and uh, helping journalists navigate the intricacies of access to public data, often held by governments and other public bodies. Uh, good morning, Matthias, and welcome. Uh, I will now leave you to introduce our guest speakers and to conduct the discussion. Thank you very much, Vera. And thank you for that introduction in this extremely important and very timely topic. I'll uh, briefly introduce our speakers and let them introduce their latest uh, projects related to access to uh, public data so that we have as much time as possible to um, dedicate to the, the Q&A section at the end as well. Uh, first up, I would like to introduce uh, David Cabot, director at uh, CBO, which is an uh, independent non-profit organization based in Spain, which monitors public authorities and which lobbies to achieve effective transparency from, uh, in particular, the Spanish institution. Um, David replaces at uh, his uh, co-director, Eva Belmonte, who had to cancel at the very last minute, but we are very happy to have you uh, with us, uh, David. And the floor is yours for the next uh, five to eight minutes, and I'll be uh, keeping track of the time. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Matthias, and um, uh, thanks everybody for the invitation. Uh, I must say, Eva is terribly sorry she couldn't make it. I mean, we all, uh, you're missing out. She's much better speaker than me, and uh, she has much more energy than me, uh, but she had a family emergency, so she's really sorry. Um, so about Cibio, as Matias said, we are a non-profit organization since 2012, based in Spain. And from the beginning, our mission as a, as a non-profit newsroom has been to, to hold power accountable. Um, and, and the way we tried to do it from the beginning was uh, using journalism. And what we found was, uh, I mean, linking to the topic of the panel, which is uh, why public data is necessary. I mean, basically, what we found was in Spain is that uh, since we didn't, we didn't have an access to information law, um, journalism relied too much on insider sources or leaks, and it was very difficult for journalists to, to hold their own agenda, or at least for us. Uh, so we, we saw from the beginning that uh, passing an access to information law and improving it and making it work was uh, like a, a, a way to, to, to create a, 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 a level playing field that allowed anyone to access and to hold accountable uh, the power outside the traditional media and for organizations like us. And also it was a way to move from uh, like commenting on what whatever the politician said yesterday into actually going into the bottom of issues, finding official documents, finding reports, finding out why a certain decision was made, always with facts and uh, in a very transparent and, and, and thorough way. So that, that's been our mission since the beginning. Um, and very briefly, I will explain how we do it. Uh, I mean, basically, sometimes we what we do is we we find information that is already public, but maybe it's not well known, like maybe official cassettes, which is a big topic for us. We we work a lot with that. So, for example, we have a very successful project um, about uh, presidential pardons in Spain. We we were the first to collect um, the pardons for the last 20 years in Spain, and we published a. A website, and we also published a number of analyses explaining uh, who was being pardoned, how many people were being pardoned, what, what what were the crimes that were being pardoned, and we were able to show that there was a bias, like that both, I mean, like both left and right governments were pardoning kind of friendly politicians or corrupt businessmen or even policemen that had been accused of torture or condemned for torture, actually. Um, so the the key element for us was first that um, the number of pardons was reduced a lot. Uh, when we published this, uh, there were like 500 pardons a year in Spain. A couple of years after we published it, it went down to 50. So, and, and we know it's because the, the government felt uh, like heightened pressure, like uh, they, they, they saw that people were watching because we keep this updated and we monitor it daily. So we saw a clear impact there because 
because someone was looking basically someone was counting and that changed the, situ the situation and the other important effect for us was that i think we moved the public debate from a very i mean a, a debate based on anecdotes like high profile cases picked by the opposition party and kind of republished by media in a very non thorough way to a debate based on trends like what's going on in the last few years like talking about I mean, like numbers based on trends and 20 years mm -hmm. of data. And for us, that's very important. And I think that's kind of summarizes um, what we do. Um, clearly, the data, which is, I think, is another topic for the for the panel today, the data is not there, I mean, often, like especially the data that is most interesting is very hard to get. And I, I guess we'll talk about it. Um, so sometimes it's not in the official gasset and you cannot just pick it up. Sometimes you have to ask for it and fight for it. And we spend sometimes years uh, following uh, access to information requests. Some of them are very basic, even like the names of advisors that are working for the ministers in Spain that was in public. So we spent like more than two years in court because part of what we do is actually a strategic litigation and we, we go to court to, to try to get this information. So even basic stuff is very hard to get. And sometimes the formats, we, we can talk about formats later. That's also a big issue. And I think one, one element that makes us a bit different, at least in these conferences, um, um, is that we are not a pure newsroom organization because sometimes we do advocacy also. Um, our view, which I think is a big uh, among journalists, and we, and we understand. So we are very careful about how we do it. And we do a very targeted, narrow and, and transparent advocacy around issues mostly about access to information or press freedom but and we see that as a continuation of our investigation so for example we did a big investigation about public procurement about how contracts were being fragmented to avoid controls um, and and we've we, we found that some of the data we needed to identify corruption rings was not available uh, or or was very bad quality. So we we lobbied to to improve the law because the law was being modified. Um, and we managed to introduce like an article that is almost our verbatim what we proposed, which says what, what information has to be public for each tender. So for us, that's a very natural continuation of since we identified an issue and we see that there is a barrier that doesn't let us do our work, we continue we, we, we then meet the parties and try to introduce this in the political agenda. Um, it's not a very common thing for newsrooms to do, but we think it makes sense. And lastly, um, yeah, uh, since it's a very hot topic now about the COVID crisis, what we are seeing in Spain is quite worrying. I mean, the, the one of the first things the government did in Spain was to stop answering um, information requests because they said it was too difficult. Um, while other functions of government were not stopped and, and public workers were still working remotely, but they stopped answering all the requests in like no ex with no further explanation. And, and actually, and the information they've been publishing, the government has been very bad. And it's well, we don't want to go into that, but but what we what we are scared is that it's very hard to know even to get concrete data about indicators like number of deaths or infections is sometimes is too tricky. And, and for us, it's very important that, I mean, people are losing trust in Spain because they, they see a lot of the measures being taken as political. Yes, the government is sometimes seen as worrying more about spin and PR than about the actual impact of measures. And it's very hard to counteract that if if we have if, if yeah because like things like who is the who are the experts that are advising the government how are measures evaluated how are they being monitored a lot of that information is just not being made public so that opacity for us is is, is like a step back it's like we are going back to the times where we didn't have an access to information law in spain and we are trying to fight that so yeah but that would be a short summary and happy to discuss further Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, David. And I think these are indeed already a number of topics that we will definitely touch upon in, in the Q&A, such as like increased obstacles against uh, data access requests, for instance, or what effect that the role of a COVID-19 crisis has also uh, been in, in this increased reluctance in handing over um, data. Um, next up, I think our speaker doesn't need that much of an introduction. Um, Stefan Horel, if I pronounce that correctly, works at 
an uh, investigative journalist for Le Monde, where she is specialized in corporate lobbying, conflict of interests, and the uh, manipulation of science. And her in-depth work on the EU regulation of endocrine disrupting chemicals was awarded the Louisa Weiss Prize for European um, Journalism. Um, go ahead, Stefan, the, uh, the floor is yours. Yes, it's, it's there. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, great. So, so this is a breast implant, by the way. I mean, all the, the collage are, are implants from the investigation. So the, uh, the ICIG implant files investigation started in 2018 for, uh, for almost a year. And um, contrary to the Panama Papers kind of investigation, the starting point was the absence of papers. We didn't have anything. Uh, the point of this investigation was to, to get data on incidents and damages caused by medical devices. Uh, and medical devices are like a category of ob medical objects that go from hospital beds to, uh, to a heart implants or stents or pacemakers, for example. So to get uh, the, the data on this in each country, we had uh, to make freedom of information requests. Uh, the only exception was the United States, where there's there's a whole database uh, uh, from of the federal uh, uh, food and drug and, and food and drug agency, the FDA. And in Europe, there was nothing. It's a com complete void. So in total, we find 1,500 uh, foils around the world. Most of them were from uh, Mexico, and they obtained almost anything. And in France, we find a few of them. The whole point of the investigation in Europe was uh, um, a group of private companies called the Notified Bodies, because in Europe you don't have some such thing as a as a, something like the European Medicines Agency. You have, you've got the EMA uh, that uh, supervises the marketing of drugs around Europe and checks that you do well even there are lots of holes in the system. Uh, they are checking uh, drugs before they are put in the on the market. With medical devices, it's very different. You don't have an official body. You have private companies called notified bodies that the manufacturers go, uh, go to with a, a check, basically, for them to, to, to read their a written file. Sometimes they don't even see uh, the implant it itself. And the notified body uh, grants uh, what we call the CE mark, Conformité Européenne. So that's the kind of sign you can see under your toaster or your toothbrush. It's, it's the same kind of process. And then you, if you go to get this CE mark in a uh, to a Hungarian notified body, you can market your implant all over Europe. So in, Fr in France, we have a, a, a law that dates from 1978, and it's very, very poor. It's very weak, and it's almost never used by journalists. So that was an okay, a good occasion, because one of uh, there's only one notified body in, in France, one of these private companies. There are, at that time, there were 58 around uh, around Europe, and one in France, and. We were very lucky that this notified body was a, a, a semi-public uh, organization. So it's called, we call it public body of an industrial and commercial nature, EPIC. So it means you can uh, you can FOI uh, basically those um, those bodies. And what we ask them is the the list of certified of the medical devices they had certified. They had given this CE mark to, but also the list of medical devices they had that were denied certification. And that would have been a very important starting point for um, a subpart of the investigation because uh, there's a phenomenon that we were aware of that is called forum shopping, where a manufacturer can go, if, if, you, if you go, you knock at the, at the door of a Hungarian notified body and, and they say, no, your fight is not good enough, we won't give you the CE mark, then you can go to the UK or to Germany or where, wherever there is a notified body and you can uh, try to get a certification from them. So that's an open door to corruption and um, 
and many other investigative investigative um, investigative topics. So, of course, the uh, French uh, notified body, uh, which is called LNE, GMED, uh, refused to give uh, the, the two lists, and they said that the, the list represented actually their uh, client list, which was uh, something they wouldn't communicate to the outer world. So we made an appeal to the uh, Freedom of Information Commission uh, that exists uh, in France. It's called the CADA, Commission d'accès aux, aux documents administratifs. And it took them several months to, to rule uh, about this. And they, they sent us the, their ruling on the day we published the implant files. So it was already too late. And uh, they, they backed the decision, the refusal of the notified body arguing that the re releasing the documents may adversely affect trade secret. So trade secret is a specific thing. It's not just like, uh, it's not com it's different from commercial secret Be since uh, 2016, when there was this trade secret directive that was adopted at the EU level, it was transposed in the French law in July, 2018. And so it means that this ruling by the uh, French Freedom of Information Commission was the first application of, of, this, uh, of this directive in France. And contrary to what all the profession was dreading when there was this, uh, the discussion at the EU level, it was not used by a company to prevent journalists from investigating. But it was the argument of trade secret was put forward by a public body against journalism and on a public health issue. So we decided to sue. Uh, so there's a lawsuit on this, that is still ongoing. It's uh, Le Monde, but also 43 organizations that joined us, uh, NGOs, but lots of, um, of journalist association within each, each in news outlet, you have a journalist. Um, uh, Société des Rédacteurs, we call them, and they all joined us uh, in this um, procedure. We were in court on the 1st of October 2020 and uh, waited like uh, 15 days to get the ruling. And so it's, it's a, we call it an administrative tribunal. What they ruled is that the list of uh, medical devices that were certified by LNE should be released to us, but they backed this idea of uh, a trade secret, protecting the list of medical devices that, that were denied certification. And what is really wrong with this decision, where of course we are happy with the first point, but we are very unhappy about the second one, because the second part of the request was the most important in, in terms of information. And we disagree with that because it's not like we are, we want to access the technical part of the of the files that the manufacturers presented to the notified bodies what we want to access to is just the name of the device and the name of the manufacturer to check whether this device is despite the fact that it was judged at some point not good enough uh, to be uh, left uh, on the eu market whether it, it is actually uh, on the eu market and so now the way we are is that we are in the, the discussions of uh, how to make the appeal to the Conseil d'État, which is like the Supreme Court for administrative uh, decisions. And so this is where we are, and we are. Um, uh, it's a very important uh, um, procedure in the sense that all over Europe, it's the first time that this trade secret directive is used. Apparently, it's, it has not been used in, in other countries. So the jurisprudence on this will be very important and a good indication of what could happen elsewhere. Thank you very much, uh, Stefan. And it's indeed going to be really uh, interesting to see how other countries and other organizations in other countries are going to use the trade secrets direct directive or actually build further upon this this case um, as well and we'll we'll talk a little bit about this in the um q a as well um but next up i want to introduce uh, anatoly bondarenko uh, the co-founder and the head of data journalism at texty.org.ua which is a small independent media organization based in kiev in ukraine uh, since 2010 and texty's main focus relies on topics such as education or the environment and its newsroom 
prefers actually reproducible journalism based on uh, open source data and code. Uh, Anatoly, the, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, uh, yes, I, I'm head of data journalism at Text, and we re really uh, we are small newsroom, but we have uh, a relatively big uh, data team. Uh, it's six people, and we uh, did a couple of uh, we are doing a couple we, a couple of projects, many many a few projects uh, with uh, data journalism projects, and uh, uh, we. We are the winners, by the way, of uh, this year's Sigma Awards for as the best news application. Uh, we use uh, uh, computational methods, uh, machine learning, uh, artificial artificial inter uh, intellects. I mean, uh, specifically deep uh, neural networks to study uh, com com propaganda, pro-Russian propaganda in Ukraine, and uh, and we use. Uh, Different type of uh, types of mod modeling to um, to show our readers uh, uh, some specific details and some progno uh, futures future progno prognosisation uh, to make a f prog uh, to forecast. Uh, for example, we did a project about COVID nineteen. It was a pro probabilistic programming. We uh, we are modeling. Uh, uh, effective uh, uh, reproduction number, one of the main uh, parameter of uh, epidemic to show in real time how how it going in uh, how it is going in our country. And for this project specifically, we need a very a big uh, a couple of different sources of data. For example, data about uh, we need a, a precise data about uh, uh, number of uh, new infected pe uh, peoples. We we need uh, data about number of tests of different tests. We need uh, data about uh, mortality. And uh, when we started this project uh, a few months ago, uh, we found that uh, basically uh, the data is absent. Uh, or, uh, to be precise. Uh, uh, we have about, I, I guess, uh, five different uh, dashboards with interactive graphics about COVID-19 here in Ukraine. But uh, you cannot uh, get data uh, to download data from any of, of these dashboards. <laughs> and uh, you, have to, you have to do it manually. Uh, and uh, we have... But... Uh, we we try to we try to use uh, freedom of information requests uh, uh, for this, but uh, it fa it failed. Uh, not only because, uh, as my colleague mentioned, uh, that governmental institutions refuse in the time of COVID refused to 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 give data uh, due to high load and and other reasons, but uh, also. Uh, because uh, I guess the main problem with freedom of information request is such and such situation as COVID-19 epidemic is that uh, actually uh, freedom of information requests uh, uh, is is not very useful for in this situation because of uh, very different speed of 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 uh, data flow. I mean, uh, uh, freedom of information requests is take a couple of a few days, probably weeks. So they, they are slow by nature, and and this situation requires very quick answers, near real time data, and and uh, uh, for AI just just don't fit to this fit to this situation. So so probably this is main problem, and this problem is the same in in each country, uh, but uh, but also I I think that. Uh, uh, Despite of this, uh, the, the information request is is still useful because they create some kind of demand uh, to uh, some kind of indication for governmental bodies which type of inf information uh, they have to provide in, in by another means. So after such requests, uh, uh, our government uh, people from okay, peop uh, some people from our government cr created. Uh, 
very good feeds of data. Uh, not 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 from the start of pandemic from a pandemic, but let's say from the May we have uh, very good uh, data sources uh, on such uh, sites as GitHub, for example. So now we we just can use and and if uh, if uh, freedom of information requests uh, uh, were absent, we uh, our government just they uh, uh, the demand and and uh, our governmental bodies uh, cannot uh, know about demand this demand specific demands and specific data so. So I, I guess uh, uh, for us is, is is useful, but in kind of uh, indirect way. You cannot get uh, uh, useful real time information for pandemic from FOEI, but uh, but you create demand for for such for such information, and uh, hopefully uh, after some time, uh, the government will provide it in in some on one or another. For, in one or another form. So, okay. Yeah. Mm. Thank you, Anatoly. And I think that's a really good point that you raise as well in the sort of um, the features of freedom of information requests that they can actually indeed generate a demand and actually result in the creation in the best case scenario of specific data sets that become available to journalists or to the wider um, public. Um, last but not least, we have uh, in this panel Friedrich Lindenberg the senior data editor at the OCCRP, which is known, of course, as the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting uh, Project, a consortium of investigative centers, media and journalists operating mainly in Eastern Europe, the Caucasus, Central Asia and Central um, America. And at OCCRP, Friedrich is responsible for the development of its data toolkit, Aleph, and he supports investigations where data analysis is needed. So Friedrich, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, um, you've already said what OCCRP is. Um, what we do is really we do these um, really kind of straight up investigative investigations that follow the money a lot of the time, right? Where um, there is some kind of abuse of either, either public funds or um, private funds, um, money laundering we work a lot on, and um, uh, the kind of kleptocracies that um, that this kind of illicit finance eventually creates in the co countries that are most affected by it. And um, in terms of how this plays out as, as, as data work, I think like we, we look for data that really helps us to follow the money. Part of that data is illicit, um, uh, leaked information that comes from, um, comes from sources, um, but a lot of it is also public data that we, we collect from, from a variety of sources. And so this is um, almost entirely an opportunistic um, uh, activity that we do where we basically go through the internet and see like what information is published in what country. Um, so if you want to know who owns a company in Kosovo, then Kosovo is one of those countries where that information is being made public. And what we then do is we put, uh, pull, put that information into this website that we operate called OCCRP Aleph, um, which is basically um, an archive of as much of this kind of information that helps people to follow the money um, documents, company ownership, documents of interest, gazettes, government procurement, etc. Um, and now this is kind of long-term work and a lot of the investigative journalism that we do is also kind of long-term investigative reporting um, where an investigation will often take six months to a year to really complete. Um, and so with COVID coming in, we we're also like wondering how do we actually react to this crisis, right? Because our no in the usual velocity, given the, 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 the speediness of events, um, it seemed somewhat inappropriate. And so um, we actually ended up thinking about the same topic that David already mentioned, um, public procurement, right? Um, COVID um, was an un unseen before a challenge in terms of how do countries kind of um, allocate resources um, in, 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 in a crisis and how do they kind of um, also contend in a, in a world market? You might remember in, in the early month of COVID in March and April and also May, and there was a, a literal race for who can get the most uh, personal protective equipment and, and and medical equipment, ventilators, all that kind of material. Um, so what we wanted to retain was kind of this idea of collaborative cross-border investigative reporting, right? So we, we basically built a network of, I think, around about 70 or so 
um, investigative um, media and journalists from different countries and um, try to collect what are all the pay, uh, all the public contracts um, that we can get our hands on at as short a notice as possible, right? This is Bosnia, this is the Czech Republic. And this kind of turned into sort of a living resource where we wouldn't just kind of complete collecting all of this data, but it kind of turned into a tracker um, where if there was a good, um, a good story or a good lead in one of those contracts that we discovered, um, people would immediately go and write it up in their country. But then we were eventually able to kind of also look at the bigger picture um, uh, and uh, see um, what has actually been the behavior of governments more generally, what has been the outcome of kind of this, this procurement race, and what has been the transparency um, that uh, people, uh, that the different countries um, showed in this, in this crisis. Um, so this is kind of our evil little map um, where you can see like what the, what our effective ab ability to, to find uh, COVID procurement at a, um, at a, at a moment's notice was, um, uh, this obviously is a little bit, um, uh, a little bit of a function, both of our ability to find the information and of the government's willingness to release the information. Um, but it's kind of giving you an idea of, um, where information was actually made available and then, um, uh, and then Belarus, right? Um, and so um, that's kind of the, the meta picture. Um, what I think is interesting about this is kind of the attempt to make a competitive analysis. Um, so to look at, um, for example, the, the range of prices that in different contracts, different countries would pay for, uh, for personal prote uh, protective equipment, um, FFP2 masks, all that kind of material, um, and, and see uh, looking at the outliers, right? So you can see that in this, in this example, um, the Czech Republic and Ukraine kind of made some of the most off off center kind of purchases of of, of personal uh, protective uh, protective equipment, and um, uh, that that most of the other kind of um, uh, European countries actually ended up in some kind of range, even though there was was a suspicion that there might be, I would say, kind of um, uh, crisis profiteering, right? Um, the other thing that we obviously observed um, was compliance in this context. It's interesting, Stefan, that you brought up um, a kind of these certificates. That's also a big thing we were able to, to see with kind of personal protective equipment during uh, COVID um, that a lot of material didn't either have certification or the certification was very blatantly fake. Um, uh, and so we, we basically they're, they're like these diploma mills for for CE certificates, and those were used a lot for, for the mass that actually ended up, ended up being bought, bought by, by European governments. Um, and um, uh, the other thing that, that obviously happened a lot was that governments would sort of suspend their procurement procedures, right? Normally a government, when it wants to buy something, right, it's a process that takes months, if not years. And um, for, for COVID, obviously governments kind of hotwired that process quite a lot. Um, as a as an analysis, I would I wouldn't even say like normally that's kind of a, a very really strong indicator of corruption, um, but like if people are dying, then probably adhering to a, a multi month process is not the right approach to take, and so this is probably um, a desirable outcome. And um, what we also ended up doing eventually was to actually publish a database of all these procurement contracts from like the I would say the first and second wave of COVID, right, if you will. Um, um, all the all the different payments, so so anyone can go to our website and kind of see um, what uh, kind of contracts did um, Bulgaria make and whom with, um, and then you, um, you you kind of link back to also where we where we found this information. A lot of the information that we actually ended up using in this was um, related to um, to TED, uh, the European Procurement Portal. Um, what didn't end up working at all was, was freedom of information requests. And um, I think just like this week, we received a response to a thing that we filed in April. Um, so that's not practical in, in, in a context like this. Um, but it's been an interesting experience basically for us to try and see, rather than doing these kind of big long-term projects, can we do kind of a trailing project that kind of both um, supports day-to-day -day reporting, for example, on the invalid certificates, but also supports um, later on a kind of meta-analysis looking at the different contracts and, 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 and what the actual kind of unit prices, for example, per country were. Um, yeah, so that's kind of one of the, the latest projects we've been working on. Thank you very much, Friedrich. And I think that's, this is indeed really like a, a common theme among all of your contributions is, is the whole question, like what is actually the effectiveness of the current state 
of uh, FOIA requests and Freedom of Information Act or laws to actually facilitate and enable the, the real time or at least a much quicker release of public access data that is needed to hold sort of the powers um, that be to, uh, to account. Um, we, we, we can come back to this uh, a little bit later in the Q&A, but I'm also really interested in hearing from our panelists how they deal with sort of data access obstacles in, in general. And I think um, it's quite timely also given a report that has come out uh, two days ago from Open Democracy, which revealed this sort of rather um, secretive unit in the UK government called the Clearinghouse Unit which instructed basically governmental departments in the UK on how to respond to quote unquote sensitive freedom of information requests, which were coming especially from a, a sort of blacklist of journalists and, and civil society organizations. And so their new reports also highlights how the UK government has granted fewer and rejected more freedom of information uh, requests than ever before. And it often stonewalls um, request as well. And I was wondering, is this sort of a trend against turning over information that you see coming back in your uh, in your own work um, as well? Um, feel free to maybe, uh, Dav I think David has also mentioned this a little bit and, and Stefan, so feel free to, uh, to jump in. Yeah, um, thanks, Matthias. Uh, yeah, definitely we are seeing that trend in Spain. I mean, we started with a very crappy law uh, with a lot of uh, deficiencies, uh, limited scope. It, from the beginning, it was clear that it was very weak and it has like a lower strength than data protect than personal protection uh, day, uh, law. So it's been, I mean, from the beginning, we knew it was going to be hard. But uh, what we've seen in the last few years, in a way, is that the government learned how to trick the law. I mean, at the beginning, there is this independent body in Spain which doesn't have a a lot of power, but at least could advise the government to to, to release information. And, and what we've seen over the last couple of years is that the government kind of realized that actually doesn't really need to listen to this independent body. So why bother? And the other thing we've seen is that, um, I mean, we started litigating three years ago um, because we saw that some information we couldn't get like on good terms. So we had to play hard. And um, what we are seeing more and more is that the government is uh, basically rejecting things that previously released so it's forcing us and every and some other people to to litigate so it's kind of getting us tired and and, ex, and uh, spending our resources because every question even one that is not critical for national security suddenly becomes a big issue and you have to go to court and it takes years so we are happy to do that and we we had a couple of wins at the supreme court against the government which made us very happy but it's true that it, it is worrying because we, we see the government dragging their feet and, and, and making everything much harder. So definitely. Friedrich, I saw you nodding as well. Is this also something that you are um, experiencing? Yeah, I'm almost kind of uh, wondering whether there's been kind of a moment of peak transparency in, in Europe, at least, that's kind of passed and is now kind of slowly trending back a little bit towards, um, towards more opacity. Um, both, I think, kind of utilizing, as, as David's saying, lawsuits, but also privacy le legislation a little bit as, mm -hmm. as means of kind of um, uh, preventing the disclosure of, of information. Um, uh, one, one example that I'm dealing with right now is um, that we're trying to get access to um, information about the contracts, uh, oh, sorry, the, um, the payments that the European Union makes to what's called pre-accession countries, right? Countries that are due to become members of the European Union in some more or less distant future. And um, what, what, what we're seeing there is this kind of beautiful ping pong game where there's like three or four different European institutions that all don't feel responsible for this, don't have the information, ask these people, ask these people. And it kind of feels very routine and almost, I would be surprised if there hadn't been a meeting about like how to kind of play this ping pong game there. Um, um, and so, uh, yeah, I think you find yourself in these kinds of tunnels more and more of, um, of people having having understood that like privacy uh, transparency legislation is in place, um, and then kind of having having thought really hard and effectively about the mitigation against that, which is quite concerning. Stefan, like do you? Yes, I saw you wanted to chip in as well. Yes, I, I agree I, with this uh, 
representation of there was this peak in transparency and then everybody's going backwards. Um, just for the anecdote in France, I would say that one of the main obstacles to uh, freedom of information request is the ignorance of the law by the very authorities. So in the past months, for example, I, I made a request to the French presidency because uh, uh, Emmanuel Macron had the very good idea to take as an advisor for agriculture matters a former lobbyist for the wine industry. And uh, so I'm working on the wine alcohol lobby. So I, I, I requested the correspondence of this person with the wine, in, with the wine um, sector. And uh, the, the, well, I, I made a call before the email because they don't, I don't know the, the, the French presidency people. And the person on the phone was like, almost like, you know, hanging up on me because she didn't even know the law existed. And I told her, well, I'm, I'm not asking you whether you want to reply. You have to, and I just need an email address to send my request. So, so th this is this is for the funny anecdote. Mm -hmm. But I I managed to get the documents in the end. <laughs> but um, what's more serious is the uh, the the how it, it things are going at the EU level. In 2013, 2014, I was working on the lobbying of the chemical and pesticides industry against. Uh, uh, the regulation of a certain type of chemicals called, called uh, endocrine disrupting chemicals and at that time i, I made ma massive free freedom of information requests and i got hundreds of pages thousands of pages of emails that helped me um, reconstruct exactly how this lobbying uh, worked and uh, succeeded uh, which is very rare to manage to 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 point you know lobbying consequence <laughs> and not just lobbying happening and um, but in the course of this request and requests made by uh, NGOs on the same topics, we saw the, the European Commission change the scope of the law without, you know, uh, they are not supposed to do that. That's the parliament. This parliament is supposed to, to, to deal with that. But they changed some uh, tiny details that make you, uh, makes it very mo much more complicated to understand what's going on. And I, I'll give just one example. Uh, when I made this request in 2013, I could, I, I had the names of people who wrote the emails inside the European Commission, and that's very important to understand the dynamics and the positions and wars sometimes inside the Commission. And uh, now they say it's only the, the the bosses' emails you can see the names of. So, but the lobbying at the uh, uh, in Brussels happens at the policy officer level, not at the head of unit. Uh, and director or commissioner level, that's much lower. And now it's black box. And uh, so this is, for me, this is a very, uh, very serious step back. Mm. And I think that's literally a really interesting observation as well, because we see on the other hand that the European Commission, for instance, is going to propose in the in the next month, actually new obligations, for instance, on the on new transparency obligations on the big tech companies to provide more access to data in, or in the name of the public interest. And so it's interesting to see the sort of tension when it comes to releasing um, information and data from, uh, from themselves, actually. I, I have one more question that is related to what we just discussed before we open it up to the, um, the general audience. But I'm also wondering, because um, many of you are actually actively working together with NGOs, with social justice movements, in making use of freedom of information requests. Um, how can this sort of activism coexist with journalism without damaging its independence? And, and do you think this sort of increased cooperation with other civil society actors are sort of part of the reasoning that we are beyond this peak transparency, as Friedrich called it, and this trend towards more um, opacity? Um, feel free if any of you wants to respond to, uh, to this one. Yeah, well, I, I'll start again. Uh, yes, because we do advocacy and uh, it's part of our mission, but um, I, we try to be very careful about it and we are very targeted about it. And uh, we focus on like mostly access to information and accountability measures, but also the, the way we like to see it is that when we start an investigation, we don't know what, I mean, we start with a question. We don't know what the, what the agenda is. I mean, we don't have a previous agenda. We, we find stuff when, during the investigation and then we propose amendments to accountability or trans transparency. Um, and we collaborate with other NGOs, but we treat them as sources. I mean, we don't, we don't 
adopt their agendas or anything like that. I mean, we are happy for our information to be used by others because if we uncover like lobbying or whatever, it can be used by people with a specific agenda to use that. But we try to keep our journalism independent. Like we start, when we approach a topic, we don't know what we are gonna find and we start with a question. We don't go in thinking we are gonna prove that this lobbying is bad, but we just want to uncover the stuff and then other people can use that if they want that that's our approach yes if i can add something to to, to that yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry Philly. as um i i don't think i don't see a problem uh, in this uh, damaging of independence i mean ngo do ngo work and journalists do journalism and if there's one thing journalists should advocate for is transparency from public uh, bodies. I mean, that's that's our work in a democracy. So uh, the, the fact that we have a, a common goal, a transparency of public institutions uh, is is not, I don't think is a problem. It's like we, we do complementary work and it's better to talk with each other rather than not to talk. Excellent. I also think it's, it's incredibly helpful for for um, activists, right? Like, I feel in a way what activism is, is building a hammer. But at some point, you have to try out whether it can actually smash in a nail. And um, so I think, um, yeah, with a lot of, lot of transparency regulations, for example, that are being established, um, one example that happened a couple of years ago was around kind of extractive industries. You can have a lot of meetings about the transparency in that sector. Um, but then eventually the question becomes, like, is the information that is being released actually practical to, to answer real questions, to answer real questions about especially political power and economic power, right? And if the information is not sufficient, then you find out basically at the moment that someone um, if someone's trying to do journalism with it, right? And that that kind of feedback cycle, I think, is also super, super virtuous. virtuous. Yeah. yeah, also because if a journalist has been working on, on money laundering, for example, for 10 years, she knows exactly what the mechanisms are. So if there is a law, proposing like a company registry, re registry transparency, that journalist knows a lot about the tricks and, and, and whether the measures being proposed are gonna actually be gonna be effective. So that's why we believe that the, the knowledge from journalists that know an, a topic very well because they've been doing it for 10, 20 years, is really important when doing advocacy. And it can be done by the same people or different people that we can discuss, but that knowledge is, is really important. Okay, I see we only have uh, 15 minutes to left to wrap up the conversation. So let's turn to the audience to see which questions they might have. And I believe that uh, Angela is going to uh, surface some questions for us. Yes, hello, hello guys. Thank you so much for your nice presentation here for this discussion in this panel. We have uh, some questions from our audience and we will start with the one asked by Emily Chesney. Yeah, here it is. Uh, Emily asks, uh, have some of you ever been forced to drop a story because of a lack of public data available? Yes, many times. It, 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 it happened for us uh, uh, many times. And uh, for this crisis, uh, we, crisis, we can't uh, publish a story about uh, excess mortality because uh, with the help of, as Friedrich say, ping pong game. And uh, we found that uh, uh, very pity state of uh, mortality statistics in Ukraine. Uh, it's a very big structural problem. It's not uh, the fact that uh, it's the governmental institutions uh, don't want to answer our FOIA. It's, it's just the fact that uh, uh, they cannot answer in principle because uh, we found after our request that uh, the delay between uh, death and uh, re one record in database about uh, about uh, mortality is uh, two months and we cannot do any anyone just uh, right now cannot do anything about this uh, this process it's kind of uh, uh, very big infrastructural problem in gathering these statistics in Ukraine. So we uh, we have to drop this story because uh, we cannot get uh, uh, good uh, and uh, fast real time, almost real time uh, 
access mortality data? I would also add, I mean, there's data that isn't public, um, but um, I, I think should be public and that's that's every day, right? So if we knew how to ask what companies does a person own in uh, Cyprus or in the British Virgin Islands, right? We drop an investigation every two hours about, about not knowing the answer to that question, right? Who owns a piece of real estate here in Berlin where I'm sitting? Um, we, I think there's, there's an investigation dying every, every minute about that topic. Um, so I think there's a lot of data that I would argue I would, would benefit from being public and uh, yeah, we just don't have access to. Uh, I continue. Uh, uh, well, you were uh, talking uh, before about uh, the role of collaboration. So Umar Hassan asked how important is the role of collabor collaboration when covering stories or investigations that involve, involve public data? And Lisa Dupuy, uh, yeah, here it is, uh, follows up on this question. So she added, in person, in person public data and disclosing government, governmental information through FOIA type requests, are you looking for scoops or opening up info for all press, including competitors? Someone wants to respond? I can start with the last one, for example. Um, I mean, when we when we submit a freedom and access information request, we try to be the first ones and we don't publicize it. I mean, I'm not a journalist, I'm a co-director, I'm not a journalist, I'm a technical person, but the journalists clearly, they, they don't want, they, they want to be the first to tell the story and that's right. Um, but what we do is when we start litigating, we start talking about it. So if we get the information, great, we publish the story. We also publish the data, the raw data in every story we make and the methodology so others can reuse it and, and maybe we open a field that others want to follow. But if, if it doesn't work and then we start to litigate and all that stuff, then we openly talk about it because then we make a story about kind of how the government is hiding that bit. But at first, we try to be the first to break up a, a topic, identify an issue. Someone wants to add something else? For the first question, I would give a shout out also to like the, the many really good organizations that exist that focus on doing FOIA work ex explicitly and that sometimes also have litigation funds. Um, here in Germany, there's um, Fragt den Staat, which is kind of an FOI portal. On the European level, there's Ask the EU and Access Info. And um, yeah, I think kind of partnering up with these on a kind of more strategic FOI matter um, can be really useful, right? It doesn't help if, if, if you're in the day-to-day -day, uh, run, but if you're trying to make a make an example out of an FOI request, um, yeah, these are these are interesting players to team up with. Yes, uh, if I may add something, it's a it's a, a recent example I've heard about uh, at the, uh, the Data Harvest Conference. It's uh, the, called the Shell, the Shell Papers Investigation in the Netherlands, where they're trying to uh, to understand the, the, the grip of the Shell company in the Netherlands. And what they decided to do is very interesting uh, move, I think, is not to be secretive about the requests. So it took them months to, uh, to build up 17 requests to 17 uh, different public bodies. And they publicized it and they created a website so the public can follow each of the requests. And their choice was, the, their choice, was, the reason to do that is to, to put pressure on the public authorities with the public opinion. And that's, I think that's an interesting way of, uh, of doing investigative journalism through voice too. We have, uh, uh, okay. I only think you wanted about something. So. Yeah, it's just a short remark. We, we, we have examples that we uh, got inspired by other media organizations about some topics. And we, uh, in, in some cases, we tried to uh, do this, uh, this uh, some kind of reporting about this topic, but from another angle, from uh, data analysis, for example. And that was the case uh, when we uh, uh, analyzed uh, thousands of images, for satellite images, uh, uh, after in a, uh, about uh, illegal ma mining uh, in in the north of Ukraine, Ill about illegal uh, amber mining, we, we created first interactive map of all uh, with with the help of machine learning. We, we created first interactive map of all uh, spots where uh, with uh, illegal amber mining. But we 
But this topic, we got this from another media organization, for, for which reported about it, it uh, uh, before before our work. We, we just try to add some kind of additional value uh, using uh, data journalism to in, in such in such cases. We have time for one last question, and this comes from the Torpila. Yeah. What to do if the oversight body of my country is stated as no oversight body appeal to courts? Appeal to the public first, I would say. I think, yeah, the, what, what, what just came up also, the, the idea of, of turning, turning some of these access issues into real um, public debates um, is helpful, right? And um, sometimes it even might expedite what a court will eventually decide. I think in general, right, we've been treating FOI during the kind of high, high season of transparency as kind of a very formalistic issue. And I think it's time to now politicize it more and to kind of say, no matter what the law says, this is something that the people should know, right? And to become advocates for, for, for access um, to, to, to critical information. And um, even if there's maybe no legal foundation, the government can always decide to publish something, right? I don't think any country has a law that mm -hmm. mandates that it cannot. So thank you so much for your answers. We we don't have uh, much more time left. So I mean, I come back to you, Matthias. Uh, so yeah, hope uh, I hope to see you again uh, in the next conference that we may have next year. Yes, thank you, Angela. And I would really like to thank the uh, the organization and all the our four. Um, excellent speakers to discuss this topic and really illustrate again like why access to public data um, is so important to achieve um, accountability from a whole range of, uh, of actors by also highlighting that actually um, it is much more challenging than ever to get access to the uh, most relevant data in a timely fashion um, these days. Uh, so thank you very much. Like if this would be a real conference, like I would invite the audience to applaud. So I will just do it myself right now. Um, but thank you all and see you uh, another time.